Hi everybody, I'm Morgan Debon, CEO and founder of Blavity Inc. Blavity Inc. is a media company and community for black millennials. We have a variety of products and services that our company offers. You all are probably familiar with them. One is Afrotech, our professional network for black professionals. Um, we have our media business, which is a digital media business focused on content creation and storytelling and narrative shifting for black folks. We have five owned and operated properties there. And then we have our ad solutions business, which focuses on um, being a full service ad solution for multicultural publishers, such as The Shade Room and of course all of Blavity's uh, properties as well. And so those are the three things that Blavity Inc. does. And it's been an incredible journey. I have around 115 plus employees, over 100 contractors that work with us on a weekly, monthly basis to create content. And uh, we've been in business for about eight years. Um, 50 years from now, I think Blavity's mission is around creating more space places, daily joy for people of color and black people specifically, and an appreciation for black culture around the world. So in terms of our impact on the world in 50 years from now, what I really think about is, have we helped black people advance in our careers? Have we helped black people have more ownership over our intellectual property and our creativity by giving us the information that we need to have successful businesses and to get through, navigate all of the legal things that we need to do to own our assets and own our intellectual property? I think about does the content and the stories that we see on big screens accurately reflect our everyday experiences across the diaspora? Or is mainstream still technically white men dominating the media industry despite the fact that in 50 years from now the majority of the community and the people in this world will be multicultural so 50 years from now I really hope you know I always say this joke to people 50 years from now I'll be in my 80s so I hope my grandkids at that point will you know look at our estate and look at all this wealth and say I don't really understand what grandma did like she just helped black people but black people don't really need help we're, we're on top so I don't really get it like where they are, we are so successful at accomplishing our mission that we've reduced inequities so much so that my grandchildren are not impressed by any of my accomplishments. The best advice that I've received that I probably should have taken but didn't, um, let me think, I think it's probably um, that I should just trust myself and trust my gut more. You know, at certain points in my career, I've been gaslit by VCs, I've been gaslit by my employees. Um, you know, I've been, I've doubted myself, um, just like many entrepreneurs do. And if I had just trusted my gut more and executed and stuck with my original vision at different points, then I think I would be further along and we would have had more impact. Don't get me wrong, I'm very grateful and I know how big of an impact that Blavity and Afrotech has had on people's daily lives, but a lot of the things that we're doing today are things that we dreamed up or I dreamed up three or four years ago, you know? And so if I had stuck to my guns and not been as influenced by competitors or, you know, what so-and-so is doing over here, or what this VC says over here, we would be further along on our original vision that we set out to do. And I think that's just one piece of advice is like, you know, you're always as entrepreneurs or founders, you're taking a bunch of inputs every single day. Everybody's telling you what you should or shouldn't do. Even watching this video, I'm about to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. And at the end of the day, you have to trust your gut because if it was rational, if it was logical, if there was a bunch of data to support it, then like there probably isn't that much opportunity there, honestly. like. Entrepreneurship is about being the person who has a incredible vision of what the world could be or should be and has the audacity to say, and I'm gonna be the one who does it, right? And so it's important that you lean into that audacity within yourself so that you can make sure that you are staying focused and accomplishing the, the mission and the vision that you set out to do with your business. Yeah, I think one code that it was shared with me, um, probably from my dad and my parents really, was that, um, you know, you gotta work as hard as you can and then you have to release your attachment to the results. So he used to say, you know, work as hard as you can and let the chips fall where they may. Meaning, do your best and whatever happens, happens. And so even when it came to like basic things like my report card, if I came back with a B on my report card or I came back with an A, the question that he asked me was, 
did you do your best? And if I said, mm, yeah, not really, <laughs> you know, even if it was an A, then I was not necessarily celebrated as much as if I had said, yes, I did, I worked as hard as I could, I put in all the effort, I did my best, I brought my best to the table every single day, and I still got a B, that was celebrated more in my household. And I think that I've tried to embody that for myself, and why that's why I have such a strong sense of personal discipline, um, and why I am always pushing for the next thing. My team gets annoyed with me because I'm like, but we should do this, and we should do this, and we should do it by next year. You know, they're like, damn, like we're good, like everything is good. Can we just be? I'm like, no, because we are not doing our best. We, there's still an opportunity for growth. There's still an opportunity for improvement, and that relent listness has allowed me to be successful um, in this market and in a really competitive space. Ooh, uninterrupted. I think that I'm just a really creative visionary. I think the things that interrupt me now are like bureaucracy, whether that's self-imposed company bureaucracy or bureaucracy of the world, paperwork, compliance, taxes. Um, all the things that you have to manage as an entrepreneur, as an owner of a business. If I am just in flow, I am dreaming up solutions. I am uh, talking to entrepreneurs and small business owners. I'm investing in people. I'm investing in other businesses. I'm buying businesses. That is me uninterrupted in my work life. In my personal life, uninterrupted, I am painting probably someplace beautiful, uh, in flow, watching the ocean and just having a little cocktail or a mocktail and enjoying something sweet and yummy. So when I started Blavity, um, I did not know anything about building a media company. My career started in Silicon Valley. Uh, well, really it started when I was at Washington University in St. Louis with my co-founders, my four co-founders, Aaron, Jeff, and Jonathan. We started the business after we graduated from school. Um, we all had gone our different ways. I was working at Intuit at the time in Silicon Valley in Mountain View, and I was in awe of this idea of the Bay Area. I was like, wait a minute, I can walk down the street and people who make all the Google stuff is here, people who are building Facebook are sitting over here, and Apple's down the street, and Palantir's right here, and we can just bike to all these places? This is crazy to me that there's so much impact in such a small group of people in a small set of physical space within the Bay Area is building products at scale for the world. And that was so inspiring to me. You know, at the same time, I definitely was like, but nobody is doing this for people of color. Nobody, when they were doing their user research, was putting black people in, as the target user. They're building their avatars. Jamal was not the name of the avatar for our target person and customer we were building stuff for. So I could see that despite the fact that this is supposed to be the most innovative place in the world, with the most capital in the world, that there was an opportunity to build something with us in mind and to build something at scale, leveraging the methodology of Silicon Valley, leveraging the capital, but doing it for us and in a way that I would be proud of the company that I worked for and built and also the work that we did every single day. And so I didn't know anything about media, but I did know how to build community and I did know how to build platforms. And most importantly, I knew where my weaknesses were and I was able to work with my business partners to let them do their thing. You know, Aaron, who now has an incredible VC, is really good at strategy. He's really good at putting all the pieces together and thinking big. Jeff, our CTO and now uh, COO, was really good at building products and really good at solving complex problems like an architect, you know? And Jonathan um, is really outgoing. I'm an introvert. So I knew we had to build the brand and we needed the brand to have a voice and a flavor and a personality and to be outside. You're not gonna catch me outside. <laughs> but Jonathan was like wearing Blavity t-shirts every single day, walking around Harlem, handing out stickers, meeting with all of our potential clients. Um, and he was a likable guy. So we were a great founding team because we balanced each other out. And also that gave me this time and space to be the CEO and the operator because I didn't have to go be everything all the time. I could do what I did well and I really trusted and relied on my co-founders to be able to get this business off the ground. And I think that um, regardless of whether you know your industry well or not, you have to ask yourself, 
am I the most qualified person in this market, in this time of, of space to do this? And for me, when I was sitting in San Francisco in 2014 and building this company and I said, the media market is really old school for the diverse space. Most black magazines, or most black media at the time was, were magazines. They had not invested in their digital presence. They barely had websites, let alone a whole media operation. And the world is getting more digital, so it's the right market. The world is getting more social. That's gonna be the distribution platform for content. This is eight years ago, right? <laughs> so, and then lastly, there's a lot of capital and um, money coming into media at the time. Mike was raising money. Um, HuffPo had just sold. Uh, BuzzFeed was raising money. Complex, right? But none of them were doing it for black people or people of color. And so that was the trifecta. The right market, the right uh, gap in an antiquated space, despite the fact that there's a mainstream like kind of game plan and pattern that I could match. And lastly, there was not that many black people in Silicon Valley. So there was a very few amount of people in the world in that specific time of point of time that could do what I do because I literally knew all the black people in Silicon Valley, <laughs> right? And so I like that was the trifecta, uh, really the quad that allowed Blavity to be really successful. Um, you know, and then we had to do the work, right? But that was the opportunity that I saw. Um, I really did not want to raise money when I first started the business. I knew that I was going to be fighting an uphill battle. Um, I didn't know the statistics because honestly nobody was even tracking it, but I could look at TechCrunch every day and see like the most successful black person in tech at the time was Tristan Walker, who founded Bevel. Um, and at the time, Tristan was still at Foursquare and BD, and then I think he was entrepreneur at residence at Andreessen Horowitz. So that was like the most successful person. He hadn't even started his company yet. And it's, uh, so I didn't totally expect to raise money, but I knew that if I could build something that was really good at scale, and then I would have opportunity and I'd have choices on what I want to do. And I think that's really my, my biggest advice to founders and specifically women and black founders is like, don't ever be dependent on venture capital because venture capital industry is still gonna take the industry a long time to catch up to where they need to be from an equitable point of view. So you wanna know, you know, be realistic about the fact that it is going to be difficult to raise money and picking a business that requires you to raise money is gonna reduce the likelihood that you're successful, you know? And I know that there's a bunch of people who will be like, no, like, mm, it's fine, build whatever you want. You know, ah, that's not me. You're not gonna get that advice from me. I'm gonna say, build something that you can build that is not dependent on some white man in a VC telling you whether your business is good or bad. You need to be self-sufficient. And so for Blavity, I knew that if we could build a huge audience, that people loved the brands that we were building, that ultimately we were gonna be able to get money, revenue dollars, and be able to actually have clients. So at the point of which our client demand required that I raise money to fulfill that demand, that's when I stopped bootstrapping. It was that because then I knew for every dollar that I raise, I'm gonna be able to print out $2 because I already have the demand. So in the media world, that demand was an uh, insertion order, IOs, where we had clients who were um, doing RFPs, requests for proposals for us, and they were like, we would love to buy from you, what, what, do you, what can you sell? And we didn't even have enough people, we didn't want well, one, we didn't even know what these words meant. <laughs> so first we had to learn the system, and then it was like, okay, now, they want to spend $100,000 with us in six months, we don't even have enough inventory to fulfill their inventory. So now I know if I can build it, there's demand for it. And this is the really important part, and this is really critical when you're a black founder and you're underestimated, uh, is that you have to typically show way more proof or way more traction that you're gonna be successful. So I would go into pitch meetings when I did eventually fundraise and say, here's my numbers. We have a million, month, million monthly unique visitors. Here's our email newsletter. We send out over 100,000 emails a day. And here is my stack of RFPs and IOs. These are brands that would love to buy from me that I can't even capture all their money because we need to get bigger. And if you look at all this and my numbers are tight and you still say, I'm not gonna invest in you, which plenty of people did, 
then we're just not the right fit. You know, you don't want to really, you, you're not really interested, right? So you kind of took a call that you weren't really interested in ever fulfilling or investing in this business. There were some people who looked at the data and said, I don't believe this data is true. Can I have access to your Google Analytics, right? And you got to not take that hit. You have to, you know, remove yourself from the ego of being offended by these people, even though it is offensive. Uh, but you got to remove that and you got to focus on getting the bag. Right, you gotta focus on what's ahead of you, which is raising the money so that you can move on and you can get back to operating your business. So we did what we needed to do, I raised the money, um, and then that first half a million that I raised, um, I then invested in salespeople so that I could drive more revenue for my business, so again, to reduce the dependency on the likelihood that I'd have to go raise again, because if you don't have revenue coming in when you raise, then you're gonna burn through your cash pretty quickly, which means you're gonna have to go back out and raise again, and you're just always raising, um, which was not the pathway that I wanted to take. Okay, so I, uh, talk to a lot of founders, a lot of small business owners. I have a program where I coach and advise small business owners in my WorkSmart program. Um, we have different advisors that come in and give people advice on things like government contracts to uh, their accounting, to how to hire a team, build org charts, like all the operational things that you need to know when you are running a business and scaling a business. And one of the questions I get all the time is, should I go raise venture funding? because everyone sees the headlines on TechCrunch and all these other places about so-and-so raises a million dollars. And they're like, oh man, a million dollars sounds great. <laughs> and I'm like, I mean, does it though? Because you don't know the terms of that investment. You don't know how much that founder is giving up in control. And so we, to evaluate if raising venture funding is right for you, uh, there's a couple things that I just recommend people think about, and I have a whole you know, set of content that I do and work smart about this, but I'll give you the cliff notes. The cliff notes are, one, uh, do you ever want to sell your business? If you know you never want to sell your business, that you want this to be a lifestyle business, that you know that you want this business to be in your family for generations, you probably shouldn't raise venture funding. Because the only way that a, that a venture capitalist will get their money back is if you sell mergers and acquisitions or you IPO, which is selling in the public market. So if you know already, I don't want to sell my business, then raising venture capital is probably not the right thing for you because your interest and the venture capital industry's interest will not be aligned. And then there will be conflict. And then that brings me to number two. Do you want to have controlling power over your business? Do you want to work for yourself? I work for my board. My board is my boss. They set my salary. They approve the budget, they approve the goals, okay? And the more, bigger your company gets, the more as the CEO of your business, you are actually reporting to the board. And guess who sits on your board? Venture capitalists. So the people who lead your rounds of funding, whether that's your Series A, your Series B, your Series C, they get a seat on the board and they get voting power on the decisions. Now when you're a young business, it kind of, it's okay, right? You still own maybe 40% of your business or 30% of your business. Uh, maybe you're still the chairperson of your board. But over time, as you raise more money, which you inevitably will likely have to do in the venture capital world, then you're gonna reduce your ownership stake every time. And then all of a sudden, you own 15% of a business that you built and they could vote you out at any point. If your company starts to hit rocky points, if the market starts to shift, they could say, hey, we think you're not really a good CEO at this level, just sit on the board, we're gonna hire a CEO. There's a lot of things that can happen when you don't have controlling interest, and you have to be okay with it. Look, I took venture capital funding, so I tell people my experience, also knowing that I've seen both sides of it. The upside of raising venture is that you can build a billion dollar business, you can build a $300 million business. Even if you only own 30% of a billion dollar business, we good, you know what I'm saying? So so that's, that's the trade-off that you have to consider, but I think it's really important that people understand the industry and what the end outcome is, because when you're starting a business, you're usually just focused on how do I get to the next step in the founder stage. You're not necessarily thinking through all of the different nuances of what happens 
after you raise, the expectations of you, how quickly you have to grow. You know, they want you to burn the money so you can buy growth so that you can raise the next round at a higher valuation because that's how their funds work, right? So these are just things to know um, and just always question, you know, there's no such thing as free money <laughs> and there's always consequences and choices that you can make. Venture capital can be incredible for you being able to sustain rocky periods of time. Um, it's incredible for recruiting, it's incredible for brand awareness, it's incredible for stability, uh, but it can also be really challenging, especially for the CEO and the founders. Well, one of the things that I think is important for people to understand about media is that, you know, media is really just the world of like creating content and getting paid for the content that is created or distributed. And every single person on Instagram and TikTok right now is a media company. You know, there are influencers who are driving millions and millions of impressions every single day on Instagram and TikTok. They're not monetizing those impressions, but technically they themselves are media companies. So I think from a media company point of view, um, what's really important for someone to be successful is figuring out how you're monetizing and owning your audience and not being dependent on any platform to access your audience. So a user who comes to Blavity.com or TravelNoir.com or ShadowAndOct.com is much more valuable to myself, our business, our clients than a user who has just followed one of those accounts on Instagram. So everything we do needs to convert to a platform or an audience that you can own, whether that's on their phones because you're texting them, a newsletter in their email inbox, or the website that they're driving to. Now there are some media companies that are really good at building and making great content um, at scale and then they get paid because their content is so incredible. So that would be an example of like LeBron James' company, Spring Hill. Um, or ESA's company, right? Because their content is so incredible that bigger platforms like HBO, Warner Media Group, is willing to pay them up front um, a, a huge amount of dollars, millions and millions of dollars, to get a first look at even what's coming down the pipeline from a content point of view so that they could potentially buy it. And that's not the route that I went with digital media. Um, we wanted to build huge audiences and own the distribution but you could also go the route of making really incredible content, selling it, and then letting somebody else distribute it. But um, yeah, like media is one of the toughest industries right now, and it doesn't have a really high multiple, so that's something else to consider if you're considering building a media company, is understanding how subscription businesses, um, recurring revenue, and not just being ad supported will impact your ability to raise at a higher level or ultimately uh, make a lot of money. Um, a time where I had to lean on my confidence in a world where other people maybe were kind of like, eh, I don't know, a little unsure, uh, was during COVID. You know, during COVID, we had to, uh, you know, COVID happened in March, well, really February of 2020. Um, but by March, it was clear to me that the likelihood that Afrotech was going to happen in person was very low. And at that point, we had probably already sold like maybe five to six million dollars in sponsorships of clients who had already signed a contract, already gone through our sales cycle to be a partner or a sponsor of Afrotech Conference in person. <laughs> and it was clear to me, it wasn't clear to the world yet, but it was clear to me that that was probably not going to happen because I had a feeling that COVID was gonna last for a long time because that's what the data showed and of course it did. Um, so I had to quickly get my team on board with the fact that we needed to build a different product. And then we had to convince our sales team to then go convince all of our clients to sign an addendum to their contract that if we don't do comp the conference in person, um, that they will keep our sponsorship uh, revenue or uh, we could postpone their sponsorship to the next year um, or they could switch out some of the products and services because it cost um, way more money to, to do, like let's say somebody's a $100,000 client 
it costs a lot of money to produce their things. If I'm doing a virtual event, then of course my costs go down quite a bit. And so we knew we needed to provide more value because what I didn't want to happen was that our clients say, well, we're gonna sponsor this cute metaverse that you created, but we're, we're gonna take 50K back because we needed that money, right? And we needed that revenue. I had employees and I was trying to save as many jobs as possible. Um, so I had to really have a lot of swag walking into my team meetings talking about a metaverse in 2020 when nobody knew what a metaverse was. I had to educate my team. I had to equip our sales team with the information that they needed so that they could convince our clients to sign that contract and keep our revenue in place and keep our business stable despite COVID and despite George Floyd as well um, and the disruptions that it caused to business. But ultimately we were able to do it and I think it was mostly because I was just like, by any means necessary, we will have a bomb ass conference this year. And if I gotta get everybody personally onto the Wi-Fi to download this tool so we can be in avatars on a speedboat in the metaverse, that's what we're gonna do. Um, but trusting my gut and being decisive was really critical to being able to make sure that Blavity Inc. as a company could make it through uh, COVID successfully and have one of our biggest years that we've ever had. Yeah, so Blavity stands for Black Gravity. Black Gravity is that force of black people coming together and defying the odds, being with one another. And we used the word Blavity when we were at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, it was just a word that was passed down through the black community there. And it stood for that moment, you know, when you're in school where everybody is sitting at the, the, the lunch table and all of a sudden it's like, don't we need to be in class? <laughs> you know, we're debating critical race theory, we're writing our last minute essays, you've got people recapping what the Alphas did last night, you know, and it's that moment of belonging and a sea of whiteness where you feel like you belong and you feel like you're able to just be yourself and you're learning and you're sharing experiences and you're feeding yourself and eating and it's just such a place of home. And so that feeling of home, that feeling of blavity is what we wanted to make sure that we were creating all across the world and that's why we named the company, why I named the company Blavity. Black ambition is that we all have the swag, we have the juice, and figuring out how to capitalize on what makes us uniquely uh, black in this space and the black persona that we have, the culture that we create, and the innovation and the creativity that we have, figuring out how to put that in a structure so that we can advance in our careers and we can advance our wealth as a community and keep the money as much as possible within our ecosystem. If we met up in five years with some champagne, what would we be toasting to? We would be toasting to a life well lived. Like, we did it. We did a Joe, we built the business, we've got an incredible team that is capable of working whether we're in the building or not in the building, and we're making an impact in the work that we do every single day. You know, that would be success. It's like Blavity's just running, and we're making things, the things are making money, people are happy, the team is happy, our audience is happy, um, and people are out here raising money and getting great jobs in tech. <laughs>